90 horsepower right there. Boy, that feels good. Our 1969 Dodge Super B 446 pack four speed all numbers matching car from way back in season two is complete and ready for the very emotional reunion with its owner. Before we do, let's take a long step back in the graveyard car's time machine and see how this car got started. They're coming to get you, Barbara. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master Mark Warman. Joined by his out of this world cousin Dougie. Oh, hi, Mark. His apprentice and daughter, Alyssa. Whoa, whoa, stop. And his childhood best friend, Royal. Mark hates everybody. His protege painter, Will Scott. You got one job. This is Graveyard Cars. So one of the first things I wanted to do when the car showed up here was to validate its originality. The car's only original once. It needed to be restored. So we had made that decision that we would restore it. Documenting the things that are on the car that would help us in the future restore cars correctly or other people out there in the world that are doing a 69A12 car is very, very important. So therefore, I took the camera guys and said, you're here until I'm done. We talked about the originality of the bolts and the fasteners that were on the car, what made them original, how we knew it was supposed to be done when the car was done. It's allowed us to be able to get where we are now and restore the car the exact same way. We started at the very front of the car and worked our way to the back. That is a date-coated vent glass. It has the original PPG logo here, the Chrysler logo here, the date code here, and the tent or no tent down there in the corner. I've got an original Bumblebee stripe on a 69 and a half A12 car. It's a very, very rare situation. So the factory may have said, I want one inch reveal on this side and one inch reveal on that side, but it's a human being doing it. So when he did this car, he's got an inch and a quarter over here and three quarters of an inch of reveal over here. I duplicate that. I want this car to look exactly the way it looked when it rolled off the assembly line. We talked about the fiberglass lift off hood. This car was an original paint car. If you look at it in this footage, it's all original paint. It never had anything done. This is an F6 spring green color. So even though the car was wearing its original paint, I thought that it was important just, again, for historical purposes and for documentation, to check the course support numbers, make sure that they match, make sure there wasn't a typo in it. Check the one against the trunk lip. In this case, everything matched the fender tag and the dash, which all match the title, which all validate this car along with the serial number on the engine and transmission as a pure, all numbers matching 69 and a half A12 Super B. And we got a WM23M, as in Michael. That means it's a modified engine application. All 69 Dodge Super B started life as a 383. That was the minimum factory engine that came in a Super B. If the car was destined to be one of the 69 and a half M code spring cars like this one is, then they changed the call out that would have been for the 383 Magnum and they made an M for modified. Then you got nine, which is the year, and A, which is Lynch Road. They were all built at Lynch Road. We discussed the carburetors at length that we had the original correct carburetors, just needed to have Scott Smith up at Harms do a complete restoration on them. We talked about the exhaust system, the original Dana, the numbers matching 446 pack engine. Now, all of these cars were super track pack cars. That means they had the code A34 on the fender tag. A34 meant that you had the 410 gear ratio. 4.10 turns to every turn of the drive shaft. That is the lowest gear ratio that the Dana ever came with. In fact, it's the lowest gear ratio any of the Mopars in that era came with. Original hangers, which are always gone because people gotta change things. They can't just leave well enough alone. I look at the condition of this, this is amazing. Other than needing detail, this is the rear finish panel that is always, always beat to death. If it hadn't been for the guardrail at the racetrack, that car would have been survivor quality. 
Well, my understanding is the accident was at the drag strip. He was doing a quarter mile race like they did back in the day. And you see, it was actually a pretty good impact into the wall. And he was moving. It started at the front and raked its way down the entire side. He didn't want to drive the car looking like that. So it got parked and the decision was made that someday we'll fix the body and paint. And as time went on, it no longer just needed body and paint. It really needed some restoration work. And that's why it ended up set so many years before we got it. There's an enormous amount of originality that can be documented when you're working on one of these cars. Whether it's what finish a bolt had on it, or where that bolt went, what the markings on the bolt, if they happen to be unique. If you look under the hood, the originality on this car was unbelievable. Now the motor had been taken out and just set back in there, but all of the fasteners, the bolts that held the fenders in place to the aprons, those were all there. So we could document paint runs if there were, for example, under the hood, runs all over in the paint. You know, that uh, quality there, them runs there put in there at the factory, you know. There's nothing I can do about that. Fargo. It's kind of funny, this is such a unique car, but with all the changes Graveyard Cars has gone through over the last decade, from the time that car showed up, we've covered a lot of ground. One of the things we didn't really cover much was the body work on it. Now, I was here and I was working with Ryan. He was my body man, phenomenal body man. So I did get some still pictures of the car. We did not replace the fender. We repaired it. We did not replace the door. We repaired it. And the quarter panel that was caved in right near that sensitive area on the quarter panel where all the style lines are, Ryan metal finished that off. The only rust that was on the car was the bottoms of the quarters. We did have to replace the bottoms of the quarters, so Ryan hand fabbed those sections for down low. The rest of the car was pretty darn straight. One other quick note is in one of the photos you'll see what Dave talks about later that his dad had put an automatic transmission in this car. Might have been what was in it when it hit the wall, who knows. He wanted to go faster, automatics can shift faster, so he put that in there. At the back of the tunnel, for the four-speed hump, it's cut out to accommodate the shifter for the automatic transmission. Right after the metal work was done, it got all the straightening done to it where it was ready for its first primer. Will has followed this car through and done a great job with it. He knows that the F6 is very, very difficult. It's a light green. It's gonna be transparent. It's gonna show underlying scratches. So his job up to where we are now has been crucial and he's come through really nicely. It was a very challenging car. Um, it's a very transparent color. So it's not like you go in there, put one or two coats of color on, or it's not a single stage either. So it's a base coat, clear coat, and you're looking at seven or eight coats to cover. I always hated the transparent colors because you're in there hour after hour putting paint on, trying to get it to cover. Get a couple coats on, wait, you know, half hour, let it dry, tack it off, a couple more coats, and it's just oh, very methodical. Go back to our FK5 burnt orange car that I promised the owner of it I would paint myself, and I did. It was 11 coats to cover that car, 11 times around that car with paint. Then you put on top of it, it's a metallic, so that prep work needs to be just spot on perfect so you don't have any sand scratches. So you got the prep work that has to be great. You have to take into consideration it's a super transparent color. Then on top of it, it's a numbers matching car. This is just all original, gorgeous car. So when it comes to the stakes, in the paint shop. They couldn't be any higher than on this car. It's one of those paint jobs where you just can't rush anything, take the time, do the steps, and the car will come out perfect. And I have to give Will credit. He did a fantastic job of getting his head around the quality that was needed on the car, what was gonna have to happen to make sure we didn't end up redoing something, and following it through to the end. The car comes out amazing. Everything I paint comes out amazing, but that also helps because I have a really good helper and a cut and buff guy that really makes my paintwork look nice. So we have our 1969 Super B that's all been painted, all the jam work's done. I had our, my helper Michael go through and he actually details these all out correctly and he lays them all out on a nice, neat, orderly fashion and then he cleans out all the threads in the doors. Once Will had finished with the car completely, uh, it was ready to assemble. It had got its wet sand and buff done to it. Next thing was put the car together and get it back to the owner.
Now, once that car came back over to the assembly shop and was ready to get put together, I took some time with Alyssa, if you guys remember, back in earlier season, because she is a new QC person, and walked around it with her, showing her what I would look for. So this is really exciting for me to be able to get to work with my dad for a little bit. He's really busy, so this never happens. I'm um, getting to walk around the car and see the details with the paint and the gaps. It's especially important when you're doing quality control. So right now you're looking at a car that looks beautiful. Just came out of the paint shop, theoretically. Should be perfect. No, there's no such thing as perfect. Oh. So what I really found interesting was my dad talking about color flop. This enigma of color flop, how you could paint a fender and a door out of the same can, but if you didn't paint them at the same time and you hung them on the car and you stand off to the side, one might look darker than the other one. That's color flop. I took the time to show her what to look for. This car had none of that. So it never occurred to me that even if you're using the same can of paint, that timing matters. So if you spray half the car, leave that can sitting out, and you get back to it the next day, the color's actually gonna be different and you're gonna run into problems later. So another key point uh, that I wanted to share with Alyssa is always my pet peeve, and that is gaps. So when we're looking at the fender and the door, we're making sure the gap is consistent from the top to the bottom. And is it the same width of a gap that you would see on the driver's side? This may seem wide, I've seen these gaps all over the place. There may be a fine last minute adjustment once we put the hood on it, but this right now looks great. When you're at the level we're at and you're doing the cars that people want done because they mean something to the family, they want them to look at least as good as they did when they rolled off the assembly line. I want them to look a lot better. And that's why I took the time to go over all that with her. Now I have a question. For who? For you, where okay. are the hood hinges on this one? Or they the should hood. have the hood hinges in place, right? Yeah, why Why don't they have hood I don't know why they wouldn't have the hood hinges in place if we're going to paint it like that, because it paint, it's got to be adjusted and painted at the same time. Are the hood hinges? They're not body color, right? Yeah, they are. Oh, yeah. God. Great. So they should be back there painted in theory? Yeah. Well, yes and no. This being a 69 and a half A12 Super oh, B God. has a fiberglass liftoff hood that doesn't use hood hinges. It just sits on these four hood pins. Okay, Dan. Education. No, I, I admit I do have fun torturing poor Alyssa. She knows most of my shtick, but she still doesn't know when I'm sneaking up on her. Uh, when my dad messes with me, I'm not having fun. He is. That's an opportunity for him to show how much knowledge he has and how much he knows. But look who he's going off of. And I love it. Is it remember the old messing with Sasquatch commercials? I love those. I'm not trying to down myself, but. How does that make you feel good? I don't know. And that's not a shot, like you look like a Sasquatch. It's just, you probably don't need the Sasquatch. Cut the, cut the Sasquatch. So I just finished the build out on Mr. Johnson's uh, 446 pack engine for his 69 and a half Spring Green Super B. What a color, just an incredible color. Love it so much. We've got the engine done. My son Eli helped me hook this up to the engine run stand. Come on, baby. We had to do a few minor adjustments to get her to kick over and fire off. Come on. <laughs> but after that, just fired up, ran beautiful. We just went ahead and set the timing. And now we're ready to install it in the car. So on the 69 and a half cars, they made 826 of them exactly like this. That means 446 pack. The fifth digit of the VIN is an M. So we're walking around the Super B and my dad's quizzing me on what options came with the A12. What's the M stand for? You did I forgot the research. that one. I... Oh, okay, you forgot that one. That's that modified. One. Yeah, special order 440. What else? Special package. No, that's not what the M means. means. It's more special money M for money. Not in this case. No. What are you guaranteed with an A12 car that you wouldn't uh, get with a regular 446 Super pack? 446 pack. That's right. That's right. That you get the big engine. Yeah, of course I know what a 446 pack is. And the brake horsepower rating on the 446 what pack the, is? Does anybody even know? Well, I do, it's 390. Oh. Well, that's a good start, you did good. Do that at home with your kids too, it's fun. So, A1269, engine conversion package. 
440. Engine conversion package 440. This is what this is. Three two-barrel carburetors. Three two-barrel carburetors right here, folks. In those trace. How many CFM on those three carburetors? 383. Yeah, Something 1,350. Like it doesn't make me feel bad or anything. I mean, that's just kind of how we play off each other. See, my generation, we have Google. Yeah. I don't well, really have to keep it That's why your here. generation are idiots. Okay. Good talk. Nobody at home probably knows either. That's why we have Google. That's why we have these resources. This is the a replica of the original fuel pump. The correct heater hoses, a replica of the original factory hose. Again, got it from our friends at OER. I'm sure it's frustrating for him that he has this all in his head and he's repeated it to me a hundred times. But that's just not the way that my brain works. Correct radiator hose, upper, with the part number on it. This is a correct replica of the original fan belt from 1969. That's Incredible. the kind of detail we go into here. I appreciate him still taking the time and going over things, and I don't mind that he does it in a joking way. In previous episodes of Graveyard Cars, we restored this beautiful top banana A57 Rally Package 72 Charger. It was a 318 with air conditioning. What transmission did it have behind that? Was it automatic, three-speed manual, pistol grip four-speed? If you think you remember, stay tuned after the break. We'll let you know how you did. Right, folks welcome back how'd you do on that one you remember in this car what transmission was behind that 318 if you said automatic congratulations you are correct it was a console shift automatic however three speed and four speed were both available in addition to the powertrain this was a full-blown real-life a53 rally car with all the whistles and bells it had a canopy vinyl top on it rally doors air conditioning rally instrument cluster this car was loaded you got dual exhaust all the way out the back with tips see where your dad liked it <laughs> yeah I know that most of you have seen us put in lots of drivetrains, and this one was just as easy as they normally are. They're not that way by accident. It's repetition, number one. Number two, a system. So that means that the very first thing that we install is the rear axle assembly with the leaf springs on it. This unit is held in place at the front with a leaf spring hanger and nuts. They're kept style nuts. At the back, it's a shackle. So the shackle goes into the car, has the nuts put on the shackle. At the front, you tighten down the Keps nuts that hold the spring hangers. Then you can connect the shocks. We always have the shocks hanging inside the car so that when the axle's in it and it goes up into place, you can put the shocks on it. All of those things make up the rear axle assembly, which offer the counterweight that we're looking for before we install that probably close to a thousand pound front engine transmission suspension setup. This is exactly how the factory did it. I don't know that they did it in the same sequence, I doubt it, but this is the basic way that they did it. Except back then, I believe they lifted the engine up into the car and the car may have moved down on top of it at the same time. In our case, the car is stationary on the bin pack lift. We raise the K-member with the transmission and cross member up into place, line it up in the holes with the frame rails and install the K-member bolts. Once the bolts are in the front, you can go to the transmission cross member. Put the bolts in it, tighten everything down, put the natural weight of everything on the drivetrain in the car, and then begin building out all the peripheral parts. Upper control arms get put into place with the adjustable cams. All right, so how this works is if you want to set the upper control arm alignment when you're down at the alignment shop, you're going to set the caster and the camber. And the way you're going to do that, you're going to put a wrench on this right here. And when you move it, watch this control arm. See that control arm going in and out? That's how you set the alignment. The back one does the exact same thing. Once you have all those pieces in, you can install the drive shaft and you have a front to back drivetrain, at least down low. Up high, you'll still have to make all your connections, put your radiator in, upper hoses, lower hoses, and all that. But for now, from a drivetrain standpoint, those are the steps. The thing that is the cherry on top of the float 
is the wheels and tires. In this case, Dave really wanted Kregers on it. His dad had Kregers on it way, way back in the day. So we were able to put 15.8 Kregers in the back, 15.7s in the front. My dad never wants to make anything easy. We have a lift. We could lower the car and put the wheels on, but you know, that's not how he wants to do it. <laughs> Good, 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 excellent. 275, 60, 15 in the rear, 245, 60, 15 in the front. And set that thing down. Look at that car, stand back, and that is why I love Kregers. That is why I had them on my car when I was a kid. I'm 58 years old now, I was 18 years old then, and I love them every bit as much. In the case of all of our cars, and our work, and our flow, we try to evolve as a shop. The way we do things now might be a little bit different than the way we did them 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. With vendors making products now that are as good or better in some cases than the factory, it really makes us look better in the end. So if you remember, we talked about the exhaust system. The ECS exhaust system on that car is a beautiful duplicate of the factory, right? down to every marking. Every step, I took time and showed Justin what to look for on this. He went out back after that, looked at an original exhaust system and compared it and absolutely agreed it is a factory system. So that's an evolution for graveyard cars. The carpet system that we also get from ECS is all laid out. There's no wrinkles in it because it came in a big flat box. It didn't come all wadded up, which we did for years. That's all we had. But time is money. So the time it takes you to pull that out and steam it and make it fit like it's supposed to, and sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, we're not interior people, we're not upholsterers, so we do the best that we can. But when it comes like that in a box and flat, all you do is put it in there, work your inside corners a little bit with the steam, and you are done. Those are the things that we're talking about, whether it's the Kreger wheels, whether it's the 1010 tires, whether it's the exhaust system from ECS, whether it's the Classic Industries interior, the PPG paint, and I know I'm dropping a lot of names and people hate that. But those are the ways that we produce cars that look like the one you're looking at right now. Same thing for the radiator. This was a replica built by Glenray Radiators of the original 2949-054. This is going back in time and building and creating a radiator that has more capacity in it, more flow, will keep the engine running much cooler than the factory one did. And when you're putting a car together that you've got a lot of money in, trust me folks, a lot of cash. You don't want it overheating. Now, do you have an open account at the police department? <laughs> we get along well. <laughs> Once the drivetrain was installed in the car, we could cut Justin loose to put the rest of it together. I've never worked on a Super B before, uh, so getting to learn the process of this car, I know some things aren't that much different, but just the unique features of this car was just a really cool thing to do. He actually restored the original grill. It's just a sleek looking grill, and I actually got to restore this one. So that was one of my favorite parts. But where we were at now is interior door trim panels needed to be installed along with the pieces that go on at the door handle, the armrest, the window crank. Make sure you clock the window crank in the right area. Instrument Specialties did a beautiful job on the dash. In fact, I actually took extra time to show him some of the things that were so right about that. These are all re-chromed originals. Wow. This is the original faceplate, and it's all re-chromed with hand-done lettering. I love sending our stuff to them because when it comes back, I don't have to do it, number one, so that's one thing. But two is just know that Mike and the team back there do a phenomenal job and they look the way that they did when they were brand new and they're not a bunch of aftermarket replacement parts. Sometimes that's the only choice you have, sometimes it's the only choice we have. Stuff's missing. But this was an original bash and so they were able to renew it. Black How do they do that? How do they get the re-chrome on there? They chrome the, the whole thing, and okay. then they black it out. Oh, and then they black it out. Yeah, gotcha. if you just look at the gauges, these that's the original mileage right there. Oh, so he opted not to switch it back to zero. When, yeah, when his dad last drove the car, that was the mileage, and I think that's such a great that's, tribute yes, to so his cool. father. They didn't put decals on the faces like some people do of the instruments. They actually did the photochemical process. Looking at it, it's a masterpiece. With it done, and knowing that everything works the way it's supposed to, Justin was able to put it in the car. 
We restored the steering column here. Again, Justin did that work. It did a phenomenal job. Used a nitrocellulose lacquer on the column so that it had the same sheen as the instrument specialties paint did on the dash. And that's the way they were from the factory. I think it was called Jewel Black or Black Jewel was the original code. So after that, Justin was able to install the front seat, the seat belts, and the rest of the things that it takes to make the car complete on the inside. Oh, look at that. That thing slides nice. It works. Locks in place. Excellent. Under the hood was just a put together. So you have your windshield washer reservoir, your brake master cylinder, your brake lines, make the connection at the front shocks, install the radiator, upper radiator hose, lower radiator hose, heater hoses, the brackets, the provisions on the insides of the aprons to hold the positive battery cable and the lower brake line. All of those are the little things that when you're done and you look at the engine compartment, it looks like 1969 everything. I got to learn so much uh, doing this. You know, there's, it had the bumblebee stripe on it. Uh, it had the, the fiberglass hood, which is just really cool uh, concept for this car. So I really like doing that. So all the decals, the color was gorgeous. I completely love this car. I love the color. I love the stance. You look at all that green, you're like, wow, that's gorgeous. But then you take a flat black hood and it just sets the car off even more. I know that we talked about the shift ball in this car in a previous season, but since some of you may be watching it now and ready to crucify me on the internet, I'd like to point out the white shift ball is not factory, it's not correct. And so the reason the white ball is in there, not the factory wood grain one, is because Dave's father had that in the car when he used to race it back in the day before he put the automatic in it. So a lot of times, if you go back to like Kimberly Cook's 1970 Barracuda, I handed her the unrestored original steering wheel because that's the one that her dad had held for many years as he was driving it. Other cars, I've left the original brake pedal pad in it, the window cranks, things that had that DNA from that original owner that I know means something. Because you can always replace that, Paul. Take it off, order one Classic Industries, put it on. But that's the original one. And I always look at things, how would I want to do it if it was mine? That's one of the touches that I think I would really like. Here we go, 69 and a half, A12, 446 pack, four speed car. Feels good so far, that's first gear. My buddy, Jamie Passon built this transmission, it feels great, handles great, no squeaks, that's good, no rattles. For a big old muscle car, not bad at all, not bad at all. I certainly know that as I get older, I get more nostalgic. And I've always been a little bit that way, but uh, mom passed away about three years ago and I find myself being more like her. Back when she was like that, I'd say, what are you doing? One time through, man, forget all that stuff. And now I'm living back in the past in a lot of things. And I know people my age are probably doing the same thing. Go back to your old hometown. Of course, I still live in mine. For me to be able to drive a car that I only dreamed of when I was a kid, never thought I would have one, didn't figure I'd even want one by the time I was an adult. But at that time, I would have loved to have it. Here I am driving around the streets of Springfield. It's manual steering, it's miserable but it was born to boogie. Here I am driving around the streets of Springfield by the old mill that I used to walk down to when I was a little kid, When I, right after my dad passed away, I was about 13 and a half. Uh, my neighbor, Ron Ackerman, showed me how to build these little birdhouses out of uh, remnants, shake remnants. And so we'd walk down to that little mill that you see me driving around and pick up the scraps, you could have them for free, and walk all the way back over to 14th Street, and we'd build little birdhouses, and we'd take them to the Saturday market and sell it to make some bunch of burners, nice little earners. Those are the memories that just are ingrained in me that make me the person I am today, 
and make me appreciate the fact that I am living this incredible dream. Boy, that feels good. Now that's torque. 390 horsepower right there, 1,350 CFM carburetors opening up. That felt amazing. Dream personified. It doesn't get any better than this. I get to work with all the people that I love and care about. I get to work on the cars that I love and care about. I get to share that with my family now that I love and care about. And I get to share it with, you know, millions of people around the world. And so when you see me driving up and down and doing my shtick and probably trying to make people laugh, just know that inside my heart is full. And there's not much more you could ask for as a businessman, as a father, as a husband. And, and I, I got two new puppies too, um, Bailey and Lily. So it's actually a father again and pretty adorable. One's a purebred, three degrees, all right? AKC, CCC, DCC. But it's not important, it's not part of the story. In a previous season of Graveyard Cars, we restored this beautiful numbers matching 1968 Dodge Charger RT. True or false? This legendary muscle car featured the 426 Hemi. If you think you know the answer to that, stay tuned after the break and I'll let you know how you did. All right, folks, welcome back. How'd you do on that one? Was our 68 Charger MM1 Turbine Bronze a factory 426 Hemi car? If you said false, congratulations, you watched the show. This car did not feature a Hemi, unfortunately, but it did have the original 440 Magnum, 375 horsepower. In addition to that, it used a console shift automatic transmission, white bumblebee stripe, matching white interior, and of course, was MM1 turbine bronze metallic. Watching Mark do his driving footage and his videos of his car going down the road, are, I love it. it. It's definitely in my top five, but it, what really sets it over the top is when you have a great guy that the car's going to. My name is Dave Johnson. I'm from Syracuse, New York. My dad purchased a Super B uh, in early 1970. He bought a pre-owned, a gentleman owned it for just a, pre, a brief amount of time. I think he bought, a, bought this car, it scared him. He took it to a Chevy dealership, and the story is a guy bought a Camaro instead. So some of these cars have been here too long. This is one of them. What he got at the end result is an all original, meticulously restored car that nobody else is gonna do better at. So while it takes a little bit longer, he gets that car and it's worth the wait. It's all worth it. It's absolutely worth it, I'd do it again. It still hasn't clicked. You know, I, I came up today, uh, I got here, and I saw it just sitting there, and it's, it's hard to think that it's my car, or it's my dad's car, it's, and it's done. I've known this car to be in an unrepaired state longer than I remember it being in a repaired state. So I've always used to seeing it just stored away and just tucked away in hibernation. That's it's kind of the way I remember it most. So very few memories of it actually in a running state. Those memories I have are good, but usually it's kind of like the elephant in the room. This is like a brother to me. It's like a family member. It's been around ever since I was uh, young. It was around, you know. When I turned eight, I moved to England and lived over there for a number of years. But before that, I was always around Mopars. Tons of them. My dad, this is one of five A12 cars my dad owned. Four Super Bs, one Roadrunner, at least three to four Hemi cars that I know of. Factory Hemi super stock cars, A990 cars. The car that he started racing after this one was a factory aluminum front end 64 Plymouth with a 426 stage three race on, uh, wedge in it. Things were real tough for my dad towards the last few years. He had a lot of challenges, a lot of financial things were, were piling up. He would be able to solve all his problems with one phone call to sell that car. He let all the other ones go, um, but not that one. Good old manual steering, right? Yep. 
One of the things I was hoping for this whole time in the back of my mind, knowing that we were gonna be done in the middle of winter with this car, is that we'd have a nice day. And we were really blessed to have a beautiful day that Dave and I could go out and drive the car. This was the first time he'd been in that car since he was a little kid, and he actually never drove it. So the fact that when you see him driving, that's the first time he's ever driven the car himself. What a wonderful, wonderful day. One of the things that I do remember about this car when I was a kid is my dad would work on it constantly. Me and him would ride up into the highway, and he all of a sudden just come to a stop. And then that's when I knew things were gonna get nuts. And he'd just gun this car, and it would just take off and launch me in the back seat. Uh, that's when I knew this car was something quite different. 1981 was the last time the car was driving, and I was in the car that night with him. Um, and then it was parked after that. See where your dad liked it? <laughs> yeah. My dad raced the Super V. Uh, he did race it at the drag strip. He often went there, but then he had a couple other race cars that came along, and then he kind of put this one, as, not aside, it became his favorite car. And you don't want to tear it up on this trip. This car is originally a four-speed car, but he did turn it into an automatic. He raced it as an automatic because he felt he get more. He had more consistent times with an automatic transmission. It was a four-speed car, went to an automatic, and then back to a four-speed. So my father worked at New Process Gear in Syracuse, New York. They make the transmissions, the four-speed transmissions. I guess he had a relationship with Tony, and he would restore the four-speeds for Tony. He'd drive down, pick up some cores, bring them back up, restore them, and he'd bring them back down to Delaware, where Tony was. Um, I've never personally met Tony, uh, but my dad spoke highly of him. Now, do you have an open account at the police department? <laughs> we get along well. <laughs> I had owned a few of my own cars. I owned my own Super B, uh, 383, B5 Blue, B5 Blue interior. And um, my dad told me, hey, you should, you're should. you not doing anything with this car. Why don't you sell it? And uh, we can do something else with the money. And I said, no, I've always wanted a Super B. And he said, well, you have one. It's a green one. And uh, we were going to do it together. So my mom told me she learned how to drive stick in this car. I remember that. Uh, my mom loves this car a lot. Got to drive? Yeah. I'll set a fork and brake on. I've never driven this car. I've ridden in it. Never driven in it. I'm apprehensive about driving it. Um, I want to drive it. I want to enjoy this car. All the work that everybody here has done, I want to enjoy the car. So that should be first there. Good job. So you never drove this no, car? No. Engine. This is the first time you've driven your dad's car? Well, I left for England in 1984. OK. The engine was in it. When I got back, it wasn't. I'm just going to have to uh, get used to used to it. I've never had anything like this. I've had muscle cars. I've had Mopars. Never had something like this. No. No, nothing close to this. Yeah, no weird. This is what I mean. It feels so solid. Like a lot of times we got to go through a bunch of stuff, finding rattles here and squeaks. This one feels good. I looked into a lot of the people locally to help with the restoration of the car. I subscribed to Mopar Collector's Guide, and I saw the uh, issue with graveyard cars on it. Just on a whim, I said, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to email these guys. And within less than 24 hours, I'm at work and my phone rings, and it's Mark Warman. My dad was like Mark in a lot of ways. I mean, he was about originality. If there was a paint drip on a car, he would photograph it and duplicate it on the restoration. I don't know what my dad would think. Looking at the end result, I'm confident he'd be very pleased. You can leave it here if you want to. Yeah. HC record. I car. can't. I can't thank you enough. I know that yeah. you sacrificed a lot. And I know that I'm not paying nearly enough for what you and your guys have done. It's all good, brother. Um, you know, the fact that you care like that is what matters to me. I love what I do, and I love 
the people and I love the cars. I hate that it's a business. Because <laughs> that's the end of it that always ends up sucking. That's it's because somebody gets mad because you're too late. Like I, I want to thank you equally for <laughs> we're so far behind on it. You never once made me feel like crap. You never once made me no. regret doing it. I was thinking like, man, this guy's been so patient. It's been so many years. He never leaned on me one time. He never tried to make me feel bad. He just said, I understand, I get it. And he knew we were also doing it at a you know, really, really discounted competitive rate to help him. I know it was a good buy for you, but I did it for that because when I heard the story, a heartbreaking story, that's what my heart told me to do and that's what my mother raised me to do. So I'm glad you were able to work with us on time and we were able to work with you on money and bring you back this, it's the nicest car we've ever jumped in and driven and not had at least something. It's really cool. It's like this was meant to be right now at this point in your life. And now your son's around where you can have fun with him in this car for the next 40 years. Will you bequeath it to him? Oh, absolutely. It's his car. <laughs> it's his already? It's already his. Well, I didn't take long. I will enjoy this car. I will take this out. I will go to car shows with it. I will enjoy it with my son. Um, it's his car. <laughs> it's not even my car. It's his car. It's going to go to him. It's not going to hide away in my garage. You know, like I've heard on the t on you know the TV shows, we're just caretakers for these cars. That's all we are. Yeah. You know? Nobody owns any of these cars. Right. You're here for a while. I've known many, many car collectors, and when they're gone, people come in and pick the bones apart, and it's it's almost heartbreaking because that person loved them and cherished them, and I know you will with this. Yeah. Here's your phone. Dream maker. <laughs> it's so rewarding for all of us to be able to return something to a family that meant so much to them. Such history in this car. Yeah, my son and I are gonna take our first drive probably to get some ice cream. And there's a place around the corner, an ice cream place that my dad actually worked at in his teenage. His first job was at a place called Gannon's, right around the corner from us. And we're gonna go there. Take into consideration the length the car's been here, how great the car looks. You have a phenomenal client that's about ready to get it. It really just makes all of it worth it. It's just such a beautiful car. It's really been a pleasure to work on this particular car. You can kind of feel proud that you were able to be a part of this, uh, making his dream uh, come true. I know he's waited a long time for this car, and uh, it's just very rewarding. I was getting ready to get out of the car with him. We had just finished our road test, and he just told me that he knew if I had not done this car, it would not be done. That he wouldn't have had the funds to do it somewhere. He wouldn't have trusted anybody else to do it. What can you say about that? It's humbling at the moment, and it's emotional at the moment, too. And when somebody tells you that, you know, guy to guy, it, it means a lot. It means the world. There's a few things in this world I'll take with me when I go, and that compliment from him is one of them. We never know which lives we influence or when or why. Not until the future eats the present anyway. We know when it's too late. Stephen King, 11-22-63. Words of wisdom, Lloyd. Words of wisdom.